Hey guys, this is Caleb with the Command Valley bringing you another Commander Deck Tech. Thank you to GameGrid for sponsoring this video. If you want to check out their new and improved store and support the channel while doing so, check out the link in the description below. We have a deck list in the description that you can copy and paste right into the deck builder and build your singles there. If you want to support the channel directly, head on over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash commandvalley to sign up today. With that out of the way, let's dive into today's commander, Linvala Shield of Seagate from the brand new Zendikar Rising set. Linvala costs one generic, one white, and one blue to cast. She is an angel wizard, which is kind of weird. She is a 3-3 with flying and has two abilities. The first says, at the beginning of combat on your turn, if you have a full party, choose target non-land permanent and opponent controls. Until your next turn, it can't attack or block, and its activated abilities can't be activated. So you have a full party when you control a cleric, a rogue, a warrior, and a wizard, which is why she's also a wizard. However, each of those creatures must be a different creature, so a rogue warrior or a changeling would only count as one party member. Party, in my opinion, is not a super powerful mechanic in EDH at all. So I'm not going to be focusing on getting a full party together with this deck whatsoever. And this is actually going to be the last time I even talk about party in the video because we're really playing Limbala for her second ability, which says, sacrifice Limbala, choose hexproof or indestructible. Creatures you control gain this ability until end of turn. With Limbala as our commander, we essentially have access to a heroic intervention in our command zone. The best part about it being that it is recurrable. White has many ways of bringing Limbala back from our graveyard which will let us abuse her ability for attacking, blocking, and board wiping. For my strategy to work, the absolute most important card in this deck is Gift of Immortality. If Limbala is enchanted with Gift of Immortality, you can sacrifice her to activate her ability, which goes on the stack. Then, she will hit the graveyard, causing Gift of Immortality to send her back to the battlefield, just in time for her own ability to then resolve from the stack, giving her and the rest of our army indestructible or hexproof, whichever one you chose. Then, at the next end step, Gift of Immortality will return attached to Limbala, allowing us to activate her ability every single turn if we choose to. So what is the overall strategy of the deck? First, get Limbala out, then get Gift of Immortality onto her as fast as possible, then stall our opponents by abusing her ability and by using Hate Bears and Pillow Fort cards, then blowing up the board with one-sided board wipes, to then use our army of tokens and flying creatures that we've created throughout the game to overrun our opponents. This deck is not the most powerful deck I've ever built, but it's perfect for players that enjoy playing Azorius, whose playgroups prefer battlecruiser style gameplay. This deck will probably not do super well against combo decks, despite having one or two of its own, which we will get to in just a bit. So if your playgroup plays a lot of creature heavy decks, then this just might be the Azorius deck for you. Let's first talk about Recursion and Protection, as it is the main focus of the deck. To increase our odds of getting out Gift of Immortality quickly, I've included three cards that can tutor it up from our deck. Enlightened Tutor, Open the Armory, and Idyllic Tutor. These cards will have other good targets in our deck if we already have Gift in our hand or on the field, but these essentially count as an extra copy of it if we don't already have it, which is super nice. Moving on from Gift of Immortality, you can play Angelic Renewal as a one-time gift effect. We've also got Hannah, Ship's Navigator, who can return gift if it gets removed, or other important enchantments or artifacts from our graveyard to our hand. Savine's Reclamation, which can bring back either Limvala or Gift from our graveyard, or both if it's flashed back. We've also got Teshar and Bishop of Rebirth, which can both bring creatures with CMC 3 or less back from our graveyard to the battlefield. Lastly, Sun Titan returns a permanent with CMC 3 or less from the graveyard to the battlefield whenever it enters the battlefield or attacks. Other recursion options include Breath of Life, False Defeat, and Resurrection, which are all sorceries that cost 4 to cast. That is only one more than Limbala costs, but still less than she would cost if we were to recast her from our command zone. The best recursion for this deck is the repeatable recursion, but just to make sure that you play a little bit more than just Gift of Immortality. 
As for redundant protection spells, I am running Mother of Runes, Lightning Greaves, Selfless Spirit, and Flawless Maneuver. Other options include Teferi's Protection, Unbreakable Formation, and Sejeri's Shelter with Sejeri Glacier on the back. It doesn't hurt to have just a bit of redundancy when it comes to protecting your investment in your army, so be sure to have at least a few of these other recursion spells or creatures. When it comes to protecting our life total from attackers, some nice pillow fort type cards come in handy such as the classics, ghostly prison, and propaganda. These enchantments will force your opponents to pay two extra mana for each creature that they want to attack you with. There's going to be another little sub theme that can slot into this deck and that is enchantments, so along with these first two, we've also got Sphere of Safety, which essentially does the same thing for a little extra mana, but the amount your opponents are required to pay for each creature to attack is equal to the number of enchantments you control. You've also got Archon of Absolution and Windborn Muse, which are both flyers that tax your opponents in the same way as the aforementioned enchantments do. This deck is going to be a little bit slower, so stalling our opponents in any way that we can is a plus. Now, let's get into the ramp and the card draw in the deck that will help us get moving quickly and keep our hand fueled. For ramp, I'm mostly running mana rocks, and our rocks that tap for colored mana include Arcane Signet, Azoria Signet, Felwar Stone, Star Compass, and Talisman of Progress. The rocks that I'm running that tap for colorless are Soul Ring, Mind Stone, and Thought Vessel. We've got the powerhouse enchantment that is Smothering Tithe. And I'm also counting Thieving Skydiver from the new set as ramp as well, since it is most likely going to steal a mana rock from our opponents when we play it. After testing out Thieving Skydiver in some of my decks, that might change, but I still haven't really gotten a chance to actually play with it yet, so for now, it falls into my ramp section. In our card draw section, I've got Drawn from Dreams, which is a sorcery that lets you look at the top seven cards of your deck, then you put two of those cards into your hand, and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. I have been super impressed with this card, and I have started putting it in more and more of my blue decks. We've also got Frantic Search that lets you draw two cards, then discard two cards, and it's essentially a free spell. And next we've got a great mana sink in the form of Pull From Tomorrow that can draw you a ton of cards in the late game. I've included Mentor of the Meek since we are playing quite a few cards that give us tokens, and Skull Clamp, which is an absolutely amazing card in any deck that's dropping tokens. Bident of Thassa and Reconnaissance Mission let us draw cards whenever one of our creatures deals combat damage to a player. Bident of Thassa can also force our opponents to swing all of their creatures once per turn cycle, which can be really good for dealing with creature threats by blocking them with our indestructible creatures, or just creating an opening for us to swing back in and knock players out of the game. Our last two cards in this section are Mystic Remora and Ristic Study, which help us draw cards when our opponents cast spells unless they pay attacks. Next up, let's talk about the interaction in this deck starting with Board Wipes. As I said earlier, the first step in getting this deck to work the way that we want it to is by getting Gift of Immortality on Limbala as soon as possible. After that, it makes it much harder for our opponents to deal with her and the rest of our board and way easier for us to cast one-sided board wipes to stall out, waiting until we get our win cons. With the Linvala gift combo, we can turn global board wipe cards like Wrath of God into an In Garrick's Wake for way cheaper. In my initial build, I am running 6 board wipes, which is double what I normally run in a deck. Azorius decks have many to choose from, and after Wrath of God, I've included Supreme Verdict, Austere Command, Day of Judgment, Martial Coup, and Cyclonic Rift because it's Rift. I don't know if this is too many or not enough, so I may eventually add or take some out, but it might just entirely depend on your meta for you. As for other interaction, I'm not running a ton, just what you would expect from White and Blue. So we've got Arcane Denial, Counterspell, and Swan Song for some counters. Then, of course, from White, we've got Path to Exile and Swords to Plowshares as some extra spot removal just in case we need it. This section's pretty flexible, and there are a lot of things that you can run in place of these, such as Dovin's Veto and Negate. It's really up to you. All right, on to tokens. This is the section that I am the iffiest about with including it in the deck, especially without actually playtesting the deck. 
It might eventually get completely replaced by creatures with flying, but I like the idea of going high with some flyers and also going wide with the rest of our creatures, especially because we could give our creatures indestructible so easily with Limvala to hold off massive attacks with our huge army of tokens. So I'm running Bishop of Wings, which gives us four life whenever an angel, aka Linvala, enters the battlefield under our control. Also, it gives us a 1-1 white spirit token with flying whenever an angel we control dies. So with our Limbala gift combo, we can gain life and create a token every single turn, which is super fun. Other creatures that will make us tokens are Brimaz, Chasm Skulker, and Hero of Bladehold. Next, we've got the instant Call the Copper Coats from Commander 2020, which I think is a seriously underrated card, especially in playgroups that prefer to play big creature heavy decks. Increasing Devotion and Secure the Wastes will also make us a ton of tokens. I'm running two Planeswalkers, Elspeth Sun's Champion and Gideon, Ally of Zendikar. All of their abilities work really well in our deck to either increase the size of our army, wipe the board, or beef up all of our creatures. Lastly, we've got Felidar Retreat from the new set. It has landfall and says whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, choose one. Either create a 2-2 white cat beast creature token or put a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control. Those creatures gain vigilance until end of turn. This is an absolutely fantastic card in our deck that will either increase the size of our army or buff up our already huge army. Our last major section for this deck tech before I briefly hit the lands is our win conditions and our combos. So here's the kicker. I have built two versions of this deck. One that contains two infinite combos and one without any combos. My reasoning for doing this is that I know that some playgroups that prefer battlecruiser style magic do not enjoy playing against decks with infinite combos. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with either style of play, it's all just based on what your playgroup or players at your LGS enjoy. So, for the deck without combos, our win cons are going to be Eldrazi Monument, Elish Norn, Mirror Entity, and Jazal Goldmane. All of these cards support our go-wide strategy by pumping up our army. Jazal and Mirror Entity are both great right after a one-sided board wipe, which actually kind of makes these whites less powerful version of Crater of Behemoth if you think about it. In my other deck, I am running two combos that will both result in us getting infinite creature tokens. The first combo consists of Ajani's Chosen, Enchanted Evening, and a removal spell that can get rid of either of these two first pieces. So, Ajani's Chosen says that whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, you create a 2-2 cat token. It does not say that you may, you have to create that token. Enchanted Evening turns all permanents into enchantments in addition to their other types. These two together create an infinite loop that if not forcibly stopped will result in the game ending in a draw because the loop does not end. So, with a Path to Exile in hand, after you've made, let's say, 2 billion cat tokens, you can hold priority after Najani's chosen trigger and exile him. And voila, you have 2 billion cats. The other combo is Intruder Alarm plus either Thraben Doomsayer or Steward of Solidarity. This combo is much easier to control. Intruder Alarm says creatures don't untap during their controller's untap steps, and whenever a creature comes into play, untap all creatures. This allows you to activate Doomsayer's or Steward's ability to tap and put a creature token onto the battlefield as many times as you want. So again, make 2 billion tokens and swing out on your next turn for the win. The trick with both of these combos is that you and your army have to actually survive a full turn cycle before you can actually end the game with it. This is where our immortal Limvala comes in super handy by giving our billions of tokens indestructible or hexproof. In my opinion, this is a pretty fair combo since your opponents are going to get an entire turn cycle to solve it or deal with it, and it's still a pretty satisfying win for you if you get to pull it off. Lastly, and real quick, here are the lands that I've included in the deck. We've got a Darkar Wastes, Castle Ardenvale, Celestial Colonnade, Command Tower, Fabled Passage, Flooded Strand, Glacial Fortress, Hall of Heliod's Generosity, Hallowed Fountain, Irrigated Farmland, Myriad Landscape, Mystic Gate, Nimbus Maze, Prairie Stream, Reliquary Tower, 
Rogue's Passage, Scavenger Grounds, Sea of Clouds, love that art, and Temple of Enlightenment. I'm also running Amaria's Call slash Amaria's Shattered Skyclave and Seagate Restoration slash Seagate Reborn as MDFCs that will be played as lands probably 95% of the time. Plus, 9 planes and 5 islands. You do not have to run all the crazy expensive lands, but definitely run Hall of Hilliard's Generosity as a way to get Gift of Immortality back if you need to. All right, you've made it to the end of the video. I have left a ton of the decisions up to you, so have fun brewing and choosing whichever one of these two decks you feel like playing the most. Please like this video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't yet. Be sure to check out and sign up for our Patreon at patreon.com slash commandvalley to support us directly, view exclusive content, and join our Discord. Not to mention you get to receive tons of merch and tons of sweet other perks, so definitely go sign up. Thanks again to GameGrid Lehigh for sponsoring our channel. You, the viewer, can click on the link to their website in the description to shop for all of your magic needs there, and you'll be supporting our channel as well. GameGrid is now shipping nationwide, so take advantage of that. Be sure to join us on our live streams every Tuesday at 7pm Mountain Standard Time for some Brawl on Arena. Lastly, you can find us on Twitter at CommandValleyP1 and on Facebook by clicking the link below. Thanks everyone, and stay safe out there.